completely blanking on the name, but that sort of, it simplifies it a little bit for the, the employer to do a sort of an every six months sort of skills uh, sort of assessment. Um, so I think that, you know, I, I think there are challenges there, but I think sort of trying to make it as, as, uh, as little of a lift on the employer's part as possible, I think is definitely what the, the, the sort of the, the, the key strategy for employers. And, 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 and you know, we're, we're always sort of talking about uh, sort of trying to maintain as light a touch as, as possible with the employers while still, of course, you know, you know, maintaining sort of a, a minimal sort of level that, that they need to be sort of involved and, to, and, and engaged to do the work well. But in terms of what we're sort of asking of them, try to keep that sort of as, as, as light touch as possible while still getting the information. That's a very fine line and a tricky balance to, uh, uh, to, 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 to take on. But, um, but, but I think keeping that in mind, I think is definitely something I would um, um, strongly sort of encourage. And, and if, if there are things that you know, and I think this is where, you know, sort of to, to the point that John sort of has been making around sort of really allowing your sort of research questions to, to drive your data collection, you, you know, especially with employers who might otherwise be, uh, might find this to be burdensome. You don't want to collect data just for the sake of collecting data and make asks of folks just to have data that you don't necessarily need. Um, so I think that's where sort of that, that, that planning on the, on the front end and really sort of being driven by the research questions uh, can really sort of come in handy. So at least then you sort of know we're collecting data that we need to answer these questions that have been determined to be very important. So in terms of that. Um, and what it will do is actually give them a final competency assessment that when they complete it, will go directly to their apprentice so they'll know that they've achieved, um, you know, success in the apprenticeship. Next slide. The, um, the final tool that we use in My Apprentice really is what we call a mentoring platform. Um, I've talked a lot about apprentices and I've talked a lot about employers, but with our community partnership, um, we call it the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program because it really consists of not only the college that serves as the intermediary and educator, but also 25 high schools, over 180 employers, and a, a lot of different economic development folks who actually have access. And as I said earlier, we'll provide access to anyone who actually wants to help us mentor these folks so they'll be successful. So if you actually look at the screen, you know, you can see what an employer would see in terms of it lists their apprentices so they can actually access and see all the information that I talked about. Um, it actually, we actually give access to our faculty staff because we're gonna award college credit um, for some of the work that they're doing on the job. So we'll be able to give this information to faculty who will be able to assess the information and actually award a grade um, if, if the student wants it and also if the employer wants it. And also we give it access to our high schools because our high schools help us mentoring, uh, mentor the apprentices if they're having problems when they're getting through the apprenticeship program. Next slide. So that's My Apprentice. Um, you know, it, it's a wonderful tool that we've, we've started using this year um, and it's working really well for us. Um, it's pretty cool to be able to see uh, when an apprentice actually not only finishes a class but actually can see when they're working and also what they're doing on the work so we can help guide and um, mentor the actual employers to, to actually complete, um, you know, maybe they need to work on some other areas and anything. So it's a wonderful tool that is, is available out there and um, I'd like to thank you for your time. And um, my, the next presentation that you'll be um, going to is leveraging youth apprenticeship data to improve program and policy. But thank you again, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, thanks, Mitchell. That was, uh, that was fantastic and actually dovetails nicely into our conversation about data. Uh, so there was a lot. It looks like we also lost our moderator. We're gonna make sure that she can come back in just a second. My name is Kate Kramer. I am the Deputy Executive Director of Advanced CTE. Um, for those of you not familiar with us, Advanced CTE is a national nonprofit um, that represents state directors and other state leaders who oversee career technical education across the country in all 50 states, DC and the US territories across secondary, post-secondary and workforce development systems. Um, we have so enjoyed being part, enjoyed the partnership and the ongoing learning over the last two plus years of being part of PIA and look forward to um, the future as we continue this work. 
Um, over the past year, Advanced CT has been leading a work group with representatives from over a dozen members of the PIA partnership focused on data and data quality, which has been facilitated by my colleague Austin Esses, who spoke on a panel yesterday. Today, we're going to be speaking, um, digging into that those issues um, and elevating what are some of the challenges and what are the real opportunities within data to advance youth apprenticeships with an, an eye towards quality and equity. Um, so I'm very excited to be moderating today's panel um, and with a really distinguished set of speakers. Um, over the past two days, we have heard from speakers and panels on critical topics such as attending to equity within youth apprenticeship, ensuring that youth apprenticeships are well integrated into our K-12 and post-secondary systems, ensuring their systems alignment between youth apprenticeships and other key state and local level initiatives and more. None of this work can happen at scale or with equity in mind without data guiding us along the way. Data is foundational to the work of developing and scaling youth apprenticeship, but is also a real challenge to get right given the complexity of youth apprenticeship programs and the many players needed to make youth apprenticeship happen. That's why I'm excited that we're going to dig into this topic today with three leading experts on data youth apprenticeship who come from those different levels and have different perspectives on both through the apprenticeship themselves, but also how we can be building out those data systems, structures, and processes. So we have uh, Dr. Amy Firestone, the Vice President of Apprenticeship Carolina for South Carolina Technical College System, who um, has unique perspective as now at the state level, previously at the local level, and as well at the federal level in her previous role at the U.S. Department of Labor. Aperv Medrocha serves as Here to Here's Director of Research and Analytics based in New York, so is bringing um, kind of that local uh, perspective in, in terms of that, that intermediary role that is so critical. And then Dr. John Wickert, that, um, an education associate in the Career Technical Education and STEM initiatives work group at the Delaware Department of Education. So our goal today, we'll see if we can get it, is to make this as conversational, um, to really have an open dialogue on this critical and complex topic. So I encourage you, as you've been doing over the last couple of days, please use the chat to ask any questions. Um, along the way, we'll, have, we'll make sure to have a dedicated portion of time to really be able to dig into that. Um, so we're going to kind of start with a nice, easy softball question. I'm going to ask each of you to kind of give a little bit more about yourself, introduce yourselves um, as we address, as, as you answer this first question. But really, from your perspective, from your viewpoint, why is data so critical to advancing your overall vision for high quality and equitable youth apprenticeships? I'll open it up to whoever wants to go first. Well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll dive in. Um... So yeah, thanks, thanks, Kate, for that introduction, and, and yeah, great, great to be on this panel. Um, so you know, I mean, I I sort of view data sort of broadly, and certainly within you know uh, the area of, of youth apprenticeships, sort of from a lens of really sort of helping us answer a, a lot of sort of uh, critical sort of questions. Um, and and you know, I many many years ago, I actually majored in uh, in journalism, so I uh, so it might be why I sort of come at it from this perspective of kind of you know, the who, what, where, when, uh, how, uh, and why. And, and I think the data can sort of really answer a lot of those questions in a way that, that sort of came to the point we're making can sort of really sort of serve as the foundation of, 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 of building and scaling uh, youth apprenticeships. So, um, you know, so you know, the who of, of, of who we want to, you know, who, who are we most interested in serving, uh, who should we be uh, engaging in partnerships with, um, you know, the, the, the what of sort of the, the, the specific activities that sort of the, the, the data sort of reveals are sort of necessary for us to sort of engage in. Um, the, um, the, the, the opportunities that are available sort of uh, looking at different sort of industry sectors and, 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 and occupation types. Um, you know, the where of the, the, the geography of where the opportunities are available, where, where again is our sort of target sort of population in terms of who we really sort of feel like needs, um, you know, could, could benefit the most from, from, uh, from, from youth apprenticeships. Um, you know, the, the, I think the why is, 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 is so, sort of sometimes overlooked, but really sort of critical in kind of making the case for, for, for the importance of this work, and, and especially when engaging with partners who might otherwise be, um, you know, if not reluctant, then certainly maybe not as, as eager as we would want them to be. I think sort of that, that case making can be really sort of important and, and, and using data to sort of say, look, this is why this work is necessary and important and can be impactful. And then I think that all sort of drives the sort of the how of, of, of how we sort of engage uh, in this work. Um, and, and, and what we're, you know, sort of, you know, within this sort of, you know, broad sort of umbrella of, of youth apprenticeships, which, you know, certainly, you know, carries certain sort of characteristics sort of across the board, 
but there's always going to be sort of different contexts in which the work sort of takes place. So sort of how we sort of, you know, respond to that context and, and, and really sort of engage in the work, I think is really driven by answers to all of that sort of the, the who, the what, the where, the when, the why. Um, and, and, and that's what I think, you know, for me, data really sort of helps uh, clarify. I guess I'll go next. Um, so I'm coming from this at a statewide level. Um, as the Vice President of the Division of Apprenticeship Carolina, we work with all 16 technical colleges in the state and local companies on developing and registering apprenticeships. So you just saw Mitchell Harp and he's from Char um, Trident Technical College, which is, which is one of our 16 technical colleges. So they're one of our shining stars um, in the 16, but we have many others that we're working with to try to get them at the same level where Trident Tech is with the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program. So data, of course, we're held accountable by data, not just at um, the technical college system office, but at the state and at the federal level. So it is really important for us to see the impact of youth apprenticeship because we've invested a lot of resources in working with companies, um, not just in the technical college system office, but statewide with all of our colleges. So it's about accountability as well. Um, we're spending all this time, we have all these resources, is anyone really benefiting from these programs? So um, that's why data is really important to us. And you saw the app that Mitch just um, presented on. That is something that we hope to bring to all 16 colleges in the state because that is a piece that, it, that is missing. Um, but it does require accountability, it requires funding, but in order to even get that far to have an app, we need very basic data on how many companies are participating, how many youth are enrolling, where are they from, what industries, what occupations. We won't know the impact to even get an app or any other um, tools to advance our data without knowing just the basics. So, I would say that the vision that I have for South Carolina is to grow capacity, to be able to collect the data and hold other areas accountable for collecting the data. Because I can't collect it all, my team can't collect it all. We rely on local, um, the local technical colleges and the companies to help us with this process. So that's just a very quick overview of where we're at. Looking forward to chatting more about this. So Kate, I love that you, you say this is a softball because I think it's really the first of a series of really hard questions for anyone in this space. Um, so from a Delaware perspective, you know, Delaware really views data as it's a way to tell our story and it's always going to be good, bad, and ugly. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You're always going to be one or all of those, those things at some point in time. Uh, but it also helps us share and express our commonality and our shared values across systems. And so for us, it's going to serve very much as a guide in terms of system development and augmentation, uh, program quality, advocacy, and funding relationships, uh, as well as measuring whether we met our goals or not. And so, what, you know, I, I really love from my fellow panelists, like the mention of accountability here, because in Delaware, we're actually trying to move past accountability models that are pinned to our data structure. And so we want to move more to a data model where it's about innovation and outcomes-based funding. Uh, that results in family sustaining wages in recession resistant occupations and the ability for learners to navigate post secondary education networks um, to upskill cross skill you know advanced career trajectories at minimal cost so we see data kind of, kind of underpinning all of that work and we actually hope to use our data system to upend what we consider to be kind of traditional funding models so something that's been on our radar is when we look in the youth apprenticeship space, especially right now, we see some similarities to uh, systemic challenges uh, with historically black colleges and universities in terms of local funding. And this idea that you easily get into this funding churn, right? There's an opportunity, there's a funder, I get it. I'm supposed to main a program and, pff, and we're off to the next one. And so we wanna build relationships where we're approaching models with funders that they're helping us on the front end to stand up systemic changes, but then providing funding into endowed um, funds that can help us sustain the programs over the longer term and then coming back again and saying great so now we want to go to version two and we're going to do upfront and then on the back end we're also going to look again at putting money into an outcome based pot so this endowed pot being based on us meeting the outcomes the funders their investment is helping us get there and so we see that as a way to not just stand up our systems but to engage in the dialogue the storytelling the relationships and underpinning the entire thing. 
And if you can stand up a structure like that, we think you can also see um, advocacy where maybe there are groups of private funders and philanthropic funders that are willing to match state funds invested into systems, right? Because again, we're all under the same data system here. And so really what we think that will result in, if we can pull this off, is for Delaware at least, a youth apprenticeship system that results in state um, regional, national, and possibly globally transferable credentials. And we think we can do all of that through the right data system. What I love about all those answers, it just shows, as I said, this is such a complex issue. And I think that just shows that data is foundational to all of it, but there are so many different purposes. I mean, I heard, which I think was, I'm so glad that it came up, the case making, the advocacy that given we're still at the beginning of this youth apprenticeship journey and having that data tell the story to engage different audiences, accountability to create funding models, um, to make sure you're serving and reaching the right, the right systems. Um, I think it just speaks to, there's so much out there. And I think something that we often struggle with is the kind of the cliche of we're really data rich, but information poor. So how do you move and transition that the data you're collecting and have, you can really be, make it actionable, whatever that action might be. So I wanna, I wanna dig in this a little bit more because given we just went through a wide array of different purposes um, and, and rationales for data, that this is hard. It's hard to collect, to get the right collection moving. And we know there are, you know, we're still pretty early on and we've had a ton of momentum, but pretty early on in growing youth apprenticeship movement. And we're seeing new programs and new policies come online constantly. So I'm curious what your recommendation is for those that are launching a new youth apprenticeship program, either at the local or regional level or a statewide effort, um, as some of you are speaking to, where, where do people start? What is the most important types of data to collect at the outset? And then what might you add as you build that capacity, build the capabilities, get the buy-in, but like what is the critical, if you don't collect this at the beginning, you are gonna set yourself up kind of for, for trouble or challenges down the line. And I might have Amy start because you kind of talked about the basics, like what are those basics? And if you wanna go on that and then we'll bring in a Perv and John into the conversation. Yeah, well, thank you, Kate. I think it, the basics are a good place to start. And I think in South Carolina, we have conquered that area and we're looking at kind of the next level and integrating different data systems to get to the next level. But in terms of basic data, first I'll say that all of our youth apprenticeships in South Carolina are registered with the U.S. Department of Labor. So um, that is really our benchmark for knowing what companies are registered, um, what the programs are, what the occupations, um, and all the different nuances for each registered program, that DOL data will give us all of that information. So we don't have to look elsewhere. Um, it also tells us where in the state that company's located um, and the age range and all of really that high level information. So having all of our programs registered with DOL gives us that opportunity. In addition, Apprenticeship Carolina just launched a pre-apprenticeship um, infrastructure. So now Apprenticeship Carolina will be reviewing all different entities that want to do pre-apprenticeships and we will be tracking and collecting data. So we have a little bit more flexibility in what we can ask from the technical colleges and K-12 and other organizations. But the basics on our end would be knowing who's in a registered apprenticeship, what company, what's the occupation, where in the state, and you know, age range. Um, Without that, we, they could be in an internship, they could be in another program that we wouldn't deem to be a high quality um, youth apprenticeship because all of ours are, like I said, registered with DOL. So that's, that's really my take on it based on the success that we've had and we wanna build upon that, but we'd have to really look at our resources and integrate with other agencies to get to the next level and that's something that we hope to work on this year. A perv, maybe you can give a, a local perspective, right? Come from a programmatic level, kind of what, what are those key foundational pieces of data that need to be kind of built into the foundation? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, mean, I think, you know, everything that, you know, sort of Amy touched on are certainly, um, you know, sort of key sort of elements of, of any sort of data collection plan related to youth apprenticeships. I mean, one thing that we did at, at Here to Here, uh, where we sort of uh, incubated, um, CareerWise New York, uh, the apprenticeship program sort of built off the CareerWise uh, Colorado uh, sort of model, um, is, is, we, is we actually sort of engaged in, in, in uh, an exercise where we really sort of, really sort of kind of utilizing sort of the theory of change model. So we're sort of starting with, with uh, our, our sort of goals. And, and in this case, in, in our sort of context locally, I mean, we're really 
you know, sort of looking at apprenticeships as, as uh, you know, very much a part, an integral part of, of, of a broader sort of push to um, sort of, you know, braid uh, um, academics and, and, and work uh, much more in a much higher quality way than, than what's currently been done. So as we sort of think about the sort of larger sort of goal of, of, of um, kind of, you know, redesigning our talent development systems in, in, in a way where apprenticeships are playing a really huge role we sort of identifying sort of what the goals are um, and what the sort of the vision is and then kind of mapping backwards and, and sort of really understanding well what, what are what are sort of the strategies that we're that we're uh, trying to execute in order to sort of get to that vision and, and specifically with apprenticeships you know where, where do apprenticeships sort of fit in into this larger vision what, what are we hoping is, is accomplished with apprenticeships in, in addition to, to, to the, of course, the young people that, that we're serving, um, gaining skills and gaining credentials and, and being on the path to a, to a family sustaining career, which is, of course, sort of priority one. But in order to do that, I think the, 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 the extent to which the needle needs to get moved for, for educators and for employers uh, in terms of the way th they think about youth apprenticeships and in terms of the way they prepare students to, um, to be ready for, uh, for an apprenticeship by the time they're, in, in our case, in 11th grade. Um, so, so thinking about those sort of strategies for sort of how we, we sort of, you know, again, sort of make the case for youth apprenticeships, but then also so the, the ways in which we sort of shift uh, thinking to really um, uh, better sort of accommodate and value youth apprenticeships. And then from there, that sort of really gets us to, okay, well then, so how do we know if what we're doing is really sort of working in, in, those, in those regards? Um, and, and that sort of leads us to a, you know, a whole series of, of sort of questions, research questions that we sort of want to answer. And which leads us to, okay, well now what's the, what's the information we need to collect to, to answer those questions to see if we actually are sort of moving the needle in terms of um, some sort of local momentum uh, around apprentice, apprenticeships, again, coming from, uh, from schools and, and from employers. Because in our case, you know, we, 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 we of course are doing this work sort of in partnership with the, with the Department of Education, but it's not sort of a, a state or sort of a, a broader sort of city sort of program uh, it's very much sort of happening sort of from the ground up. Um, so in that case, there, you know, I think with that being the case in particular, we, we, we really need to sort of move sort of the hearts and minds of people to really, again, sort of get them to not just accommodate, but really sort of value the role of apprenticeships. And, and, and so that's a, a big part of our sort of data collection effort uh, as well as sort of trying to sort of gauge, you know, how much are we moving the needle in terms of, 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 of partner, you know, school employer uh, engagement. Uh, in addition to all those things that Amy mentioned in terms of some of those sort of basics around, well, you know, how many folks are doing, you know, how many folks are doing it, what industries and, and all that type of thing. Don, I'm curious from a state that obviously has a very sophisticated data system, kind of where do you start? Where do you move? And, and I'm going to, I'm going to pose this just because it hasn't come up yet. I also want to kind of put equity into this, right? We haven't really talked about in terms of making sure, you know, how you're segregating data, how you're setting up that in the front end. That's something that, um, I'm sure Delaware is attending to, but if you could add that in, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so I think I want to start with our approach to data is very much um, at its core, right? Data has to inform our system and our evaluation. It has to be actionable. Um, it has to be minimally burdensome to collect, right? Like those are kind of core principles for us in terms of getting the data. And we've learned a lot about what not to do from actually previous data systems that we've looked at. And so I think to give you some context, when we started looking at the data we had in place, we realized we didn't have what we felt like we needed. And so what we did under our WIOA and Perkins combined state plan is we actually brought multiple lines under the same umbrella, right? And the same delivery policy. So we pulled together credential apprenticeship and degree programs, right? Into the same kind of system driver. And what that allowed us to do was to have the influence in the system to reset the data system because we pulled all of the effective parties right into the same sphere. And so what we're actually um, doing is we're going, we're designing our data system around research. So we're not looking at saying what data do we have and then what questions do we wanna answer? We're actually pulling in local state and national partners and saying to them, what are the research questions that you would like us to be able to answer that you think are value in the space? And then we're collectively designing the entire system around that. So it's a very kind of different model. And our, our goal here, and this kind of goes to your equity conversation, Kate, if you need me to go farther, let me know. Um, so around that, our goal is to just get like 80% of this right the first time, like the core, and get it really right the first time. And then build out um, 
But what we're doing at the department is because we have the ability to broker and manage data agreements, what we're doing is we're handling that lift and that's how we're matching in the SNAP, TANF, and all of these other linkages, as well as post-secondary clearinghouse and other systems data. So we're collecting from all of these partners, we're matching all of this data, we're de-identifying de the data, and then we're pushing it back out and supporting our partners around these routines. And so it's a very kind of different way of approaching it. We're making sure we can answer the questions up front versus later finding out maybe we can't answer what we wanted to. Um, and the other thing we're doing is we're supporting our local partners by using Perkins reserve funds in order to cover the cost of system augmentation. So we've already found system limitations at the local level. We're using our Perkins funds to pay for systems enhancements and to support our partners through the transition. Again, so that they can execute their commitments with the minimum amount of lift. And so, right, that's gonna give us, and again, I mentioned earlier, our, kind of our outcome space piece. So we've instituted some pieces there around the enrollment and concentration of economically disadvantaged individuals, with this, which is a much larger conversation. But um, I think to your point, we recognize that there's a real moral imperative behind the work, right? And so for us, this data does not lead to what I mentioned before, which is the family sustaining wages and recession resistant occupations and the ability to navigate these systems. The data is probably not worth collecting for us and we won't attempt to collect it. I want to turn back to a perp because my next question, and I think John, you set up really well, is this like local and state role and the balance between the state leaders and building up the data infrastructure and setting the indicators that need to be collected and setting up accountability. And then the local, the program role, right, in terms of actually collection and um, reporting up and engaging all the partners. And it obviously looks different from program to program and state to state, but I'm curious of her from your perspective, right? As you mentioned, you're, you work with your local department of education, but you're really kind of your own program. It's not any, so what do you see as a state role? Um, I don't know whether if John hit it or not, or if you have a slightly different and how that balance between what the state needs, what guidance and support you need from the state and where you need that flexibility at the local level or the program level. Yeah, I mean, I think at this point, I mean, we're, we're, sort of very early uh, in, in our sort of, uh, you know, youth apprenticeship sort of journey. And, you know, so yeah, so at this point, a lot, most of what we're doing has been quite sort of independent. So, um, and, and, I, and I know the, the, the career wise folks now are, are, uh, are working with the state on, on getting apprenticeships uh, registered and, 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 and all of that. Um, so, you know, so from, from my perspective at the moment, I, I would actually, you know, love to have more guidance, you know, from, from the state, which I know is something oftentimes people will sort of want, uh, you know, the opposite of that and more sort of autonomy. Um, but, but I would love to actually be able to work with, uh, work with the state and, and, and sort of, you know, integrate what we're doing with youth apprenticeships into their sort of, you know, uh, broader sort of apprenticeship uh, sort of data systems and, and, and other systems. Um, to get a sense of you know what 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 it is that they're collecting um, and 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 so that we can sort of share information and and, and share platforms and, and and things of that nature. So you know right now the work has been quite sort of yeah we're 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 somewhat sort of left to do the work sort of independently, which is is, which is really great in a lot of ways because we then we can sort of make those decisions and we can sort of formulate the research questions and then say okay this, this is how we're going to go out and collect this data. Um, but then at the same time, it, it, it you know. One, it, it sort of makes it a little bit more difficult sometimes to collect when you don't necessarily have the authority uh, that, that, that a state, uh, you know, um, uh, entity um, would have. Um, and then also it's just, you know, I, I, again, I think to have that sort of partnership at that level where, where information can be shared and where, and where, you know, like platforms can be, can be utilized, I think could be, um, could be really meaningful and valuable. So I'm, I'm sort of hoping that we, that, that we get there um, but I'm, I, for now, I'm sort of grateful that at, at the moment we're sort of setting uh, the, the terms a little bit in terms of what kind of data we feel like is really valuable to collect and, and what we're sort of prioritizing. Uh, but I'm but I'm hopeful that'll be more of a partnership um, sort of going forward. Thanks, thanks, Aper. And Amy, I know I mentioned earlier you've kind of sat at at all levels, so I'm curious um, where you land on what that balance is between the state, local, and I guess if you wanna if you wanna attend to it, the federal role, um, we could bring them in as well since we've already been talking about some of the federal requirements. 
Yeah, I guess um, I do have an interesting perspective and I'm trying to navigate it myself to see what we can do to improve data on apprenticeships in South Carolina. And I'd say there's a lot, I know this is another question you have about challenges, but um, there are a lot of barriers. And I think both of both Aparva and, and John alluded to those barriers in terms of not being connected to the larger state system. Aparva, you were talking about the um, not being as connected with the apprenticeships and how that data might be collected. And, and John, you're very data focused, but maybe in terms of the individual programs happening, um, you, you all don't have as much of a connection. So we're kind of all of it here with Apprenticeship Carolina because we are the statewide apprenticeship intermediary. So um, I would say having access and having the federal data from our companies is extremely important because um, that's data we can use for different audiences like other companies. So I think I'm kind of talking in circles, Kate, but I think the bigger question is the audience of the, for the data. And there's data that we need from all levels to be able to speak to different audiences. So we have um, a new ROI study on youth apprenticeship that came out last week, which I'll share with you, Kate, and the PIA network to show um, over the past five years, how many companies have experienced a positive ROI from hiring youth apprentices. That data is invaluable to show other companies so they'll invest in youth apprenticeship. However, when I meet with um, school counselors or other um, K-12 individuals, that data does not have as much value, but showing the outcomes for students such as degrees obtained, a lot of the stuff that you saw from Mitch Harp's presentation, all of that data is very valuable to educators. So combining all that data in one place is another mountain to climb, both local, state, federal level. And with Apprenticeship Carolina, we're looking at new data systems. And luckily, we do have a lot of funds to be able to connect different systems. But all of the processes for MOUs between different agencies and what data they're allowed to share and want to share and can share is, is a huge challenge. So I think going back to the audience and who you're trying to sell the youth apprenticeship program to, whether it's getting more companies on board, that ROI data is, is golden, or showing those success stories, like coming from Charleston or the Midlands in our state or the upstate. Um, those success stories are, are valuable to other students, to parents. Um, that, that's a different type of data. That's a type of qualitative data. So I think we're talking about qualitative, quantitative, and then the audiences. So there's a lot of things to digest here, and it's there's no perfect system, state, local, federal, they all have gaps, they all have holes, um, but it's looking at your audience and what data will be compelling to them. That's a long answer, Kate. No, I, but I think, that, I think that's right, and I think, you know, it's not, the state can't solve it all, but has to set guidelines and has to set some, you know, I mean, in order to really access state funding, access federal funding, but it doesn't, it's never going to mean that the local program isn't going to have to be collecting more to tell that story, to engage um, their employers and their community, to provide probably more actionable data for their educators and the supervisors to be able to support. So it does take all levels, um, but I think you know, the, starting with the research question, starting with the, the audiences is a, is a great place to start given it, it can obviously very easily um, spiral out of control. So we've got a couple of questions from audience, audience members that I think want to get into the brass tacks, like the, the, the details. So one of the first question is what tools you're using to collect data? Um, so I don't know if you want to quickly kind of you know, off the shelf things you've created, obviously some statewide systems. I'll, I'll take a stab at this one first. I think it's a great question. Uh, and we're still kind of working through this. So our approach was to first survey and find out what com what is being collected and exported from the data systems of our partners, um, because we didn't want to make assumptions about what we knew their capabilities were. So um, what we actually did was um, engage in uh, a, data, a data exchange that was kind of twofold. One was student data and one was programmatic data with our partners. And we had them each export a certain number of records to us so that we could just see what was coming out of their systems. And then we also asked them where that information was going. And we just did that with Excel. Um, and it just opened the doors for us, uh, you know, uh, in terms of insight into systems that we've never seen before or where they, perhaps data was duplicative, right? And processes weren't as clean as they could be. And so what we've decided to do, uh, most of our partners are using the LACES system 
um, because of apprenticeship data. And so we're going to help augment and, and enhance that system so it fits our shared purposes. Um, but we're also looking at what our end goal is going to be in terms of, to Amy's point, who are our audiences, what are the messages they need to deliver, what are the data they need. So we're actually not putting a stake in the ground yet in terms of what the best way to do this is until we have a better handle on um, what the data actually is, the stories we want to tell, who it's for, what it needs to look like, and then do we need to build a system around that so that we have long-term system functionality? Because the last thing we want to do is create another system that's another barrier, that's another burden, that doesn't talk to something else, right? And it causes more trouble for our partners. So I, Amy's point really, uh, or um, comments earlier, really resonated with me around this understanding of what do your partners need and not coming to an assumption first around how, how all of this needs to work. It's really listening and then letting the state be the catalyst potentially, right? To removing barriers, creating the right conditions and supporting its partners. I don't know if Amy or Perv, anything to add? Any tools you guys are using that could be useful? Well, I know we're using sort of for our basic sort of participant um, and other sort of stakeholder uh, engagement data, we're using Salesforce. So we sort of have the, the, the portal through which students can apply and, 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 and eventually be placed into internships is, is connected to Salesforce. So we have that information um, there. And then that's also a place where we can sort of go in and, and put in and sort of, you know, notes on pulse checks and, and, and things of that nature. And then, and then, you know, when it comes to some of the other data that we're trying to collect, um, you know, we're, we're issuing sort of a lot of surveys, you know, to, to students, uh, school staff, employers as well, again, to sort of speak to that sort of, uh, that sort of systems change piece and then any sort of potential shifts in, in, in mindsets and things like that, that we're seeing. So, um, so that's, you know, we, we use a, we use a platform called type form, which is, you know, you could just use Google forms for those surveys, kind of whatever, whatever one prefers. Um, so that's another sort of tool that we're using, um, to, to collect, uh, information, uh, from, from the range of stakeholders, um, in, in, in this case, survey information. I don't know if Amy, if you have anything or kind of no, drop we have a little bit. Yeah, we have a lot of sources, whether we get data from um, individual spreadsheets that we upload into another system. Our IT office has the magic sauce to combine many different data sources and put them into one report. So I have here my weekly apprenticeship report. I get to see what's going on across the state uh, for youth and adult apprenticeships, um, the top six industries, the top six occupations, and that's coming from a couple different sources that are magically combined behind the scenes. Um, well, that actually answers my next question um, that someone, uh, Autumn, uh, posed, which is really around, like, what are your, like, key metrics? I know we've raised them a little bit, but then how often are you analyzing that data and looking at the metrics? Um, and so that's your weekly, which I think is, is probably, <laughs> I would imagine, well, I, I actually I don't want to assume when a Perv and John, if you're looking at, you're getting uh, weekly data reports, but curious, what are some of those other key metrics? And what are those processes for actually looking at the data, reviewing the data, making it actionable, which I think what this is really all about. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for us, you know, it, there, there's, there's certain, it, I mean, it, it certainly is sort of ongoing uh, in terms of, you know, how, how often uh, we sort of access the data. I, I mean, I think there are certain sort of critical points at which we, that, at, at which we you know, certainly sort of take a deeper sort of dive into the data. I think certainly sort of after uh, a, an enrollment cycle uh, where we have a new cohort of, of young people um, uh, placed into apprenticeships uh, to, to start their apprenticeships, getting a sense of, of, of that data. Um, you know, what, what, what does a new cohort look like sort of right off the bat? And then, you know, again, another sort of deep dive that occurs sort of at the end of every sort of program year, uh, again, where some of those survey year end surveys come out and things like that, but then also to sort of see, um, and again, something we're tracking, you know, sort of ongoing in an ongoing way, but looking at sort of retention and, and, and things like that. But then at the end of the year, getting a sense of things like, you know, program satisfaction and, and some of the other things that sort of come out of the survey. So I think, you know, at, at the beginning of sort of the program cycle and at the end of the program, uh, at the end of the program year, I think are sort of sort of the two sort of critical junctures at which we really sort of get, you know, look at the data and get a sense of, okay, you know, what, what went well or, you know, in, ter in terms of sort of recruitment uh, for, for, the, for the newest cohort and then what went well for, for all the cohorts in terms of or, or didn't go well for all the cohorts throughout the course uh, of, of, of the program year. So, and obviously there's, there's a lot of sort of, you know, ongoing sort of uh, checks uh, on, on the data sort of, you know, throughout, but those are sort of, I think, the sort of the two critical points. 
for us? You know, so for us, I, my answer right now is I don't know yet. And the reason I don't know yet is because we're allowing our research to design, our research design to answer those questions, right? So depending on how the research design flushes out, some things make sense to analyze, say, annually, right? Um, some of the data might be more worth looking at a little more frequently. Um, some data might be more appropriate to Amy's point for certain audiences than others. Um, so again, I go back to like, for us, we're really trying to upend the way we've approached this compared to in the past. And so we're really relying heavily on researchers uh, that we've pulled into this work to help advise us on what is the right approach to this. Um, because we, we really believe in this um, research first approach to our data system. Um, so, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna ask one more question, then I'm gonna ask my wrap-up question. But something that we've heard a lot about and hasn't come up explicitly here is one of the major challenges is getting the data and information we need from employers. Um, obviously, again, the, the showcase we had beforehand showed kind of one model of that. But um, particularly as we think about the data around student skill progression, their competency attainment to be able to mark that progress, not just are they participating, not just are they completing both that experiences. So is this a challenge that you've seen and are there any strategies you, you could recommend that have mitigated um, or you know, made it easier to get that or to get employers um, to be able to provide the data without putting that burden on them? I don't know, Amy. I'll jump in, Kate, and say that it's an impossible task. It's very challenging. Um, with the grants that we have, we have to do a lot of that data collection. We have been for the past five years, not for um, youth apprenticeship. And there's a lot of holes. And um, people come and go from companies. So it's hard to really have um, good follow up. And I'd say just having boots on the ground that can do that follow up is really important but the companies are really there to train um, the apprentices so having to give them homework um, is is very challenging and i'd say that we're we're looking at just providing more support from our staff to do that follow-up um, and hope that that helps us achieve um, you know better return rate with the data from the companies but it is it is a burden um, when the companies are really focused on providing that that mentorship and you know high quality training opportunity. I don't know if you have any any strategy recommendations, ways that you can get the information we need but keep that burden as low as possible. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, so you know, career wise and, and, and here to here, we use a, a platform that I'm. I'm completely blanking on the name, but that sort of, it simplifies it a little bit for the, the employer to do a sort of an every six months sort of skills uh, sort of assessment. Um, so I think that, you know, I, I think there are challenges there, but I think sort of trying to make it as, as, uh, as little of a lift on the employer's part as possible, I think is definitely what the, the sort of the, the, the key strategy for employers. And, 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 and you know, we're, we're always sort of talking about uh, sort of trying to maintain as light a touch as, as possible with the employers while still, of course, you know, you know, maintaining sort of a, a minimal sort of level that, that they need to be sort of involved and, to, and engaged to do the work well. But in terms of what we're sort of asking of them, try to keep that sort of as, as, as light touch as possible while still getting the information. That's a very fine line and a tricky balance to, uh, uh, to, 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 to take on. But, um, but, but I think keeping that in mind, I think is definitely something I would um, um, strongly sort of encourage. And, and if, if there are things that you know, and then I think this is where, you know, sort of to, to the point that John sort of has been making around sort of really allowing your sort of research questions to, to drive your data collection, you, you know, especially with employers who might otherwise be, uh, might find this to be burdensome. You don't want to collect data just for the sake of collecting data and make asks of folks just to have data that you don't necessarily need. Um, so I think that's where sort of that, that, that planning on the, on the front end and really sort of being driven by the research questions uh, can really sort of come in handy. So at least then you sort of know we're collecting data that we need to answer these questions that have been determined to be very important. So actually engaging the employers on it, I mean, it, it, is, it is challenging. It, it, and, and I guess, yeah, again, just, just to sort of keep that as light lift as possible for the employers, I think, is, is, uh, is the way to go. All right, well, we have, thank you so much. We have one minute left and I asked you each, I gave you each 30 seconds in the prep, but I'm gonna strike down to 20 seconds. So we can get it done in a minute, which is what is one lesson or piece of advice you have around accessing or using data to drive quality, equity, and decision-making? So we'll do a quick, rapid, one or two sentences. Why don't we start with Amy? 
Uh, I think I go back to what I said in the beginning is start with the basics and make sure you have that with even the first program because once you start growing rapidly, it's going to be really hard to backtrack and get that data. Some of these folks don't even live in the state anymore. They may, um, you know, have gone somewhere else. So to try to backtrack and find people and find companies find, is just impossible. So I'd say start from the beginning, get the basics down, and then build from there. Okay, perv. Um, yeah, also just to sort of reiterate what, you know, uh, from before, just really sort of be clear about sort of what your goals are and kind of what your strategies are uh, and allow that to sort of drive your, your uh, data collection. I imagine, John. One single thing with four components, go slow to go fast. Make sure you know where the point of inflection between outputs and outcomes are by asking so what questions. Be clear on your shared goals, barriers, partnerships, right, and connections in your data systems. Know in the beginning who will find value in the data. So to Amy's point, your audiences. And then the last thing is keep it as simple as possible because that's what everybody needs in this world is a little bit of simplicity. We can always make it more complicated later. That's great. Well, thank you all so much. I hope everyone will virtually join me in thanking um, our, our panelists all on behalf of the rest of you. Um, just as I, as I just one heads up I want to give, I should have mentioned at the top, which is um, Advanced CT, as I mentioned, has been facilitating this work group uh, focus on data. We will be releasing a memo summarizing the findings from that next month. So I know our friends at New America will help make sure that gets in the hands of all of you. Um, and with that, thank you again for your time and I'm gonna turn it over to Taylor.